Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us today for this special webinar for our computer science applicants who will be joining us for the September 2024 entry. Um, this webinar is just going to give you a bit of an introduction to your school, um, which is the School of Physics, Engineering and Computer Science. Um, now, the session is recorded. It's nothing to worry about. It's just in case anybody's internet connection drops, we'll be able to share a copy of the recording later on as well for you, or if you want to watch any sections back as well. Now, during the webinar, um, you do have access to the chat on your screen, so you can use the button to talk to each other if you want to. If you do have any questions, please use the Q&A for your questions instead of the chat, just because me and the other panelists will then go to Q&A at the end, and we don't want to miss any of your questions if the chat's moved quite quickly. Now, just to give you an idea of who we've got in the session today, um, my name's Kat and I work in the international office, so I'll be here to answer a few questions you might have around the start of term. Hi everybody, my name's Jess and I work with Kat in the international office. Hello, I'm Dr. Nathan Becker, I'm an admissions tutor and lecturer from the Department of Computer Science. Hi everybody, I'm Ellen. I also work in the international office and I'll be on the Q&A to help answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're your hosts for the session today. So if you do have any questions throughout, use that Q&A button and we'll be answering those after the slideshow is finished as well. Now, just to give you an idea of the content that we're going to go through. So you'll have an introduction to your school of study. After that, we'll move on to some start of term preparation. So there is some things that you can be doing now to help you. And then we'll go on to the Q&A. So post your questions as we go. So now I'm going to just do a short poll just to find out um, who we've got in the room. You might have some future classmates in there with you as well. Um, so I'm going to launch this on screen and you should be able to take part in the buttons if you want to. So we're just going to find out which subject you'll be studying. So I'm just going to launch that now. OK, so you should be able to see these buttons now on your screen. So if you do want to take part, um, just click which subject you'll be coming for and then we'll have a look at these results together. This is great. I can see lots of you filling out the answers already, which is brilliant. Um, definitely some other people will be in your class because I can see you've got multiple people answering each one as well. So that's really nice. We've almost had everyone fill this in now, so I'm going to close the poll in um, in just a second. So if you are waiting to submit your answer, please do so now. Okay, so we can have a look at these results now. So we've got lots of people from a range of the courses across computer science. Um, lots of you are coming here to do um, the standard computer science route or advanced computer science. We've then got a few looking into the artificial intelligence and cybersecurity and networks courses as well. And even some students will be doing data science and analytics, information technology and software engineering. Um, so that's brilliant to see. Now what we'll do um, is I'm going to pass to my colleague, Nathan, who's going to give you a bit of information about the school. Hello. Um, so as I said, I'm Dr. Nathan Becker. I'm a lecturer here at the Department of Computer Science, and I'm also an admissions tutor. And one interesting thing is, just like yourselves, I was once an international student here many moons ago. So um, Kath, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so here at the Department of Computer Science, we have strong relationships with business and industry. We have local organizations like OCADO and EE, which we've had partnerships with. And we are one of the oldest computer science departments in the UK. We had our first set of BSc um, in computer science students in 1965. And in 1968, the Department of Computer Science was founded. Then we were called the Hatfield Technical College. 
1969, our first graduates in BSc Computer Science graduated. We had 12 students who graduated then. And then in 1971, we had our first set of master's students for the MSc in Computer Science. And we will be celebrating the 60th anniversary of our computer science degree in 2025. So there's a lot of heritage here, and we've done this for a very long time. And you can choose from a wide range of specialist modules to match your interests, which we'll look at. And we have world-class learning and experiential facilities to help you engage with your studies. Um, Catherine, can we go to the next slide? So programs which you would probably, which you, you probably plan on studying for the undergraduate pathways, we have the BSc Honours in Computer Science, which some of you might be doing, and for specializations or, or pathways which you would have specifically, specifically chosen, we have um, Artificial Intelligence, Cybersecurity and Network, Software Engineering, and uh, BSc Honours in Information Technology. And for those of you who are going after the postgraduate awards, you would have either gone for MSc in Artificial Intelligence or Robotics, or the MSc in Computer Networks and System Security, the MSc in Cybersecurity, or the MSc in Data Science and Analytics, which is a pretty big and huge area now, and um, MSc Software Engineering, MSc Advanced Computer Science. And for those who have come from another field, MSc Computer Science, which so all of this um, awards and pathways give you an opportunity to work on your specific interests or what it is you're specifically interested in. Um, so Catherine, can we go to the next slide? And so we have lots of facilities to help you with your studies, which you would use during your time here. So we have about 3,000 meters squares of lab space. So in the first picture to your left, that's one of our computer labs. I think there's about a hundred plus computers in that lab for you to use during practical sessions. We also use that lab for tests, if you have a computer mediated test. And to the right, you can see our robot Baxter. That's in the robotics lab. So Baxter is an industrial robot that's usually used for in, in factories and things like that. But here in the lab, we've he has been programmed to play um, checkers. And so this is something, if you're on our AI and robotics routes, you would get to work with these kind of robots. And we have a lab with several pieces of equipment and industrial robots, which you can program. And it would probably be a part of one of your modules. And then at the bottom to the left, you would see the robot with the gentleman. So that's a picture from our robot house. So this is a research facility where we try to investigate how we can integrate robots into everyday life for elderly people to help them at home. So here you can see the robot is serving cookies to the gentleman. So the idea is to try to find how robots could be used to help people at home with different kinds of things. So for example, old people who might find it hard moving around or getting things, if robots can help them. So this is research we've been carrying out for a number of years. And then to the right of that, you can see that little guy, he's a robot, which um, has been programmed to move around the room and it can, it can, avoid obstacles, avoid walls, and it, it can sense its environment and know where it's going to. And also we have an LRC, which you have 24 seven access to. So this is a learning resource center where we have books, study areas. I remember when I studied here, that was a facility I used a lot. And it really helped me during my projects because I was able to spend lots of nights in there working and it was a nice space for me and colleagues to meet together and work on team projects or things like that we had to work on. So it's a very good space and excellent facility. And we, for specs, so the School of Physics, Engineering and Computer Science, we're going to be moving into a new building in September this year. So when you come, you'll be moving into the new building, which I have never seen what's in there before, but I'll show you a video on that shortly. And then we also have specialist labs for cybersecurity and networking, 
So you would have things like switches, servers, routers, and different things you can work on. And we have a special lab in the new building for that state-of-the-art facility. And we have multimedia labs, and we also have a UX and accessibility lab, which will be coming soon. So here we would have different kinds of equipment. Someone who's working in user experience or accessibility can look at to determine how they can build more accessible um, websites or devices for people with disabilities. And then we have device labs where you find things like the little guy on the right. And then we have the robotics and AI labs where you would also have those little guys and the giant robot Baxter and some other robots and also project labs to help you with different kinds of projects. Um, can I? Next slide. And so the next, next we're going to play a video. So this is a message from our Dean, Professor Daniel McCloskey. Hello, I'm Daniel McCluskey, Dean of School of Physics, Engineering and Computer Science. Thank you for applying to one of the courses in my school. You've made a great choice. Physics, mathematics, the many areas of engineering, robotics, computer science and information technology influence all aspects of our life and help to provide and maintain the modern high technology world we live in. I see the courses in my school as a force for good. They drive economic growth, shape our daily lives and transform communities. Our courses are designed to reflect the needs of industry now and in the future. We focus on equipping you with theoretical concepts and practical skills to solve the challenges of our ever evolving world. You will benefit from applying your learning to real life projects and scenarios. We have a vibrant program of co-curricular activities. These present you with opportunity to develop valuable interpersonal, team working and employment skills. To apply your learning in real life scenarios and in areas that you have an interest in. These opportunities are great fun and build identity and community across the school. You will learn from exceptional scientists, engineers, computer scientists and mathematicians at the forefront of their fields. You will benefit from some fabulous facilities. We have staff who want to share with you their many years experience in industry so that you are ready to use this after graduation. And you'll also benefit from the strong links that we have with businesses such as Airbus, Apple, Aston Martin, Canon, Global Invercom, McLaren, Microsoft and Rolls-Royce amongst many others. Our alumni now work in companies large and small in the UK and around the world on many exciting projects that aim to make the world a better place for us all. I wish you every success in your studies and hope to welcome you into my school in the future. Good luck. Hey, next we show you our new building, which we're going to be moving in to in September this year. So once you join us, you'd be moving into this new building. So this just shows you what to expect. The University of Hertfordshire is responding directly to the UK skills gap investing and inspiring a new generation of computer scientists, mathematicians, engineers, and physicists. Central to this response is the construction of a new multi-million pound state-of-the-art five-story facility to serve the next generation. This facility which we are creating for the School of Physics, Engineering, and Computing Science. This will build on the heritage of the institution in engineering, particularly aeronautical engineering, but more recently automotive engineering, and of course our marvellous research in physics and mathematics. It will also contribute to the overall strategy of the university, enhancing the opportunities that we give undergraduates and research workers, creating a flexible learning environment, and of course underpinning the community in terms of the economy and in terms of prosperity. Set to open in 2024, the new building will house modelling, simulation and research labs, a robotics lab, advanced cyber security facilities, an automotive lab complete with an electric vehicle centre, a wind tunnel and flight simulator. Students will have access to the state-of-the-art cyber security facilities, while the upper floors will provide space for workshops, research and computer science, as well as social and meeting spaces. 
This building will be open to businesses across the region and beyond as part of our commitment to nurture companies to get started or grow. As one of only 20 recognised university enterprise zones in the UK, we provide access to world-class academic expertise and specialist facilities to help small and medium-sized companies to turn their ideas into commercial reality. So get ready to be inspired as we bring our vision to life transforming the way we educate our students and engage with businesses across the region. Okay, so that was our new building, which we are very excited to be moving into in September. And that's where you'd be moving into once you join us. So it will be an incredible space. I'm looking really looking forward to it. So for accreditations and employment supports, all our degrees are accredited and recognized. And we have specific courses which are being accredited by the British Computer Society. So that's the Chartered Institute for IT. And it's important that our courses are accredited. And that's just to make sure when you're going on to employment, um, your employers can see your degree is recognized and accredited. And for example, having accreditation from the British Computer Society is important. It's, it's a good thing to have. And for careers and employment, we have a career hub, which will help you. So if you're an undergraduate student, for example, and you're going to be, you're going to be working on, um, you have a placement in your third year, the Career Hub will help you with preparing for that, applying for places for a placement. And also, if you're an MSc student who is doing one of our sandwich programs, they will help you in applying for uh, placements during that time. And when you finish your degree with us, they will also help you with um, preparing for to join the workforce, applying for jobs. And you get four years of support from Student Circus, which is a service we have access to and you would have access to. And so it's kind of an online global career resource and jobs platform for international students. And you can find, find jobs for up to, I think about 30 plus countries. So your own country and other countries, and you have access to this for four years and you still have access to a career as well to get advice during that time. Um, Catherine, next slide. And this is a very important bit. So engagement and attendance. This is very important for you and important for me because I'll be te if you're an MSc, I'll be teaching you on one of our mandatory courses. So it's very e very important that you're ready to start your course on the program start dates because if you miss the start dates, you would miss a lot of content on the course. So it's good to start with everyone so you're on the same page with with the whole cohort and you're not missing out on anything because we would have things like uh, practicals and tutorials which you would be required to engage in and if you miss out on that it could cause issues for you later on and so your engagement with studies is monitors you will need to attend face-to-face -face sessions so all your um, classes on campus tutorials and practicals you need to make sure you attend those and you would need to swipe your id card when you attend those sessions. So usually what we have is when you come into class, there is a thing at the front where you can tap your card and it's important you do that. And if your engagement such attendance is below 80%, you may be withdrawn from the program. And as an inter international student, this is a very big risk because you can then get deported, which is something you wouldn't want to happen. So it's important that you attend all your sessions. And you should also ensure you're living within an easy commute of campus. So you know you can easily attend sessions and use resources like the LRC. Like I remember during my time here, I lived very close by. So it was easy for me to access that LRC anytime I wanted. And it was easy for me to meet with other colleagues who lived around and we could all work together in the LRC. So it's important as an international student, you try your best to live within an easy commute to campus because you could have issues where trains might not be working, there could be strikes and you could miss a lecture or miss a test or miss an exam. So but if you're living close by, you can easily walk on campus. And so it, it, it's important to make sure you're living within an easy commute of campus. 
That's a very important thing to consider. And uh, Catherine, next slide. So there's lots of opportunities because we have strong links with businesses and we have lots of um, interest in local businesses. EE, uh, one of the biggest mobile service providers in the UK have their headquarters here in Hatfield. Ocado, another huge company, has their headquarters here. I think even Tesco has their headquarters in Welland. So there's lots of opportunities and we have strong links to different businesses, even businesses outside the country. And we've had recent graduates from computer science who have gone on to work at amazing organizations. Some of my students too, who have, super, have supervised, gone on to work at Microsoft, Sega Europe, Canon UK, and EE. And career pathways they've gone into include, so some of them have gone on to be software developers, they've gone on to be programmers, web developers, business analysts, database administrators, project managers, IT consultants. Me, I went on to become a lecturer. At a point, I used to be a researcher. And I'm sure there's lots of other people who have finished here who have gone on to be lecturers and researchers, and I've done all these things. So we you do have a lot of opportunities, and, it's, and that's very important. OK, um, Catherine, can we go to the next slide? OK, and now a brief look at our research. So this video will be presented by um, one of our professors who is big in the area of artificial intelligence robotics, Professor Farshid. There we go. I'm Farshid Amir Abdullahian. I'm a professor of human-robot interaction at the University of Hertfordshire. I work at the Department of Computer Science in the university. I'm the university's team champion in information and security, and I am also managing a lab in assistive and rehabilitation technology. In the past 50 years or so, we have discovered that robots and technology, robotic technology, can help us a lot in our day-to-day -day lives. With the rise in the number of our people in the planet, we need to grow more food, and we find that machines such as automatic tractors and uh, automatic automatic harvesting machines can help us with the mass volume that we need. And the same will apply to our healthcare need. The same will apply to every single problem that we face because of our large number of people living on the planet. Robotic technology can do things repeatedly with less error. And because of that, we find them valuable technology to help us. By bringing robotic technology into the field of human and robot interaction, we can get machines to do the more difficult part of our job, while we can then humans focus on the simpler tasks or tasks that need the compassion tasks that need the person-person interaction but they haven't yet found a way into everyday life such as being our companions or being people that will help us in shops or in hospitals uh, this is changing slowly but we haven't yet reached to a common agreement for the acceptability of the technology so as we are more and more technology oriented, we find that we know a lot about ourselves by what the technology can see from us. We are able to sometimes predict what can happen. One example is tsunami warning, for example. You can see the technology that are being put into, into seas and oceans, and these technologies will feel uh, all the earthquakes that are coming and all the possible tsunamis will provide an advanced warning. I think the future with AI would be a safer future because of the way that AI can look at the past data and all the possibilities and alert us of all the dangers that we may face. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you for listening. And now I pass it on to Kat. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, and then everybody who's got questions for Nathan will be coming to those shortly. So I can see you've put some questions in the Q&A already, which is brilliant. I'm just going to do a short section now to help you on what you need to prepare for the start of term. And then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, so there's a few things you, you might all be in different areas of your application journey. Um, so you can see on the right hand side of this slide, um, there's a very rough idea of the pathway that you might go down. So most of you, I'm guessing, are around the area where you've got a conditional offer. You might still need to submit some documents or pay your deposit um, or even do a sponsorship interview or financial checks. 
Now, if those are needed, the admissions team will let you know. You'll get an email with guidance on what you need to submit and what the format will be. But for those of you who just need to submit your conditional documents or pay your deposit, make sure you're getting those in as soon as you can, because that's when we can start progressing you through the next application stage. We can start issuing CAS now for any applicants who reach the CAS stage. Um, so that's always a good place to be in because then you can make a start on your visa applications as well. Um, now we're just going to do another short poll just to get you all involved. So regarding starting hearts and the things that you can get involved in, we just want an idea of what are you most looking forward to. Um, so other than the learning on your course, there's also the social side at hearts as well. Now, this poll will be multiple choice, so you can answer as many as you wish. But which activity are you most looking forward to? So you should be able to see that on your screen now. You've got things like joining a society, exploring Hatfield, exploring London, taking part in Heart Squad Sports or attending an SU event at the forum. So choose as many as you'd like. And it's just to give you an idea of what's at hearts outside of the academic world as well, because this is going to give you a chance to meet students who aren't doing the same course as you, meet students from other areas as well, and expand your friendship groups to help you settle in a bit quicker. Um, so I'm just going to leave this poll open for another few minutes, and then we'll have a look at these results together. Excellent. So I can see lots of people have joined in. So I am going to close the poll in now. So if you are just hovering over to submit your answer, please do so. Um, but we'll have a look at these together now. Thank you to everyone who took part as well. So lots of different options here. We can see a lot of people are actually interested in doing everything of these, which is brilliant. Um, but the most ones that people are excited are for joining a society, which is brilliant. I'm going to talk a bit more about society shortly as well. Exploring the local area. So Hatfield has quite a lot um, for you to have a look around. There's the shopping centre, the gallery, lots of restaurants and cafes. And then we've also got the train station as well, which is just 25 minutes into King's Cross in London. So you'll be able to explore London easily as well. Um, so we're just going to move on now with the rest of the slideshow. So um, some things that you need to consider when you're preparing to travel to the UK. Now, we will be doing other webinars closer to the time, so later in the summer. So keep an eye out for those in your inbox. There'll be a similar format to this one, but they're all going to be focused around pre-arrival guidance and what you need to do exactly to help you for the start of term. So there'll be a lot more in-depth than this one. Now, we will be updating our pre-arrival guide, which is pages on our website. There's about four pages. Um, and once that's ready, again, we'll email you out to let you know. So keep an eye on your emails. And that's something that you can read through in there. It just has things like packing checklists, travel tips for navigating the airport if it's your first time flying, how to get from the four closest airports to the university to campus if you're using public transport. And a few other bits in there as well, like uh, picking up your BRP card, accommodation, where to go when you're on campus, what to do in your first week. So do make sure you're familiar with that and take the time to read it as well. Alongside the pre-departure webinars, we do also usually do some other webinars to introduce you to some of the support teams on campus and the registration teams as well. So you're welcome to join those. Now, Check the travel requirements. So you'll need to make sure that you've got your documents with you. And again, these will be listed on the pre-arrival guide and we'll start sending you emails about this over the summer months. Check the packing checklist. So for most airlines, you'll have an airline luggage limit. Make sure that you don't go over that and you're not carrying anything in your luggage that is prohibited to take on the airplanes as well. And make sure that you've got your valuables in your hand luggage. There'll be a few airport tips, um, such as uh, don't use the e-gates if you do have a passport that allows you to use e-gates, because usually you'll need that stamp in your passport. Um, and just some tips on keeping your baggage with you when to arrive. We also usually offer a free airport collection on arrivals weekend from Heathrow to campus. 
we'll send you out some more information about that as well once we've got all the coaches and everything set up um, but if you are arriving to Heathrow during that weekend it's a really easy way to get to campus and you can start making friends as soon as you arrive as well. Now, there will also be orientation and freshers week. So usually the orientation week starts one week before the main start of term. This is just a chance for you to be on campus, start navigating your way around, learn where the supermarkets are, get settled in using the LRCs before classes start. So if you can get here in time for that, it's well worth it. Keep an eye on the events calendar on the run up to start of term and throughout your time as a student as well. Um, the events calendar gets updated throughout the year. So you'll see as we move closer to start of term, a lot of events will be put on there. A lot of them are free. Some of them you might have to pay for depending on what it is, but some of them um, will have sort of free food available. Um, there'll be events where it's, you know, you, you can just drop by and make friends and most of them are run by either the SU or the Dean of Students or Hearts Squad or some other teams around Hearts as well. We do recommend join as many activities as you can. Um, it's a great way, as we've said, to meet people, make friends outside of your course as well um, and also feel a bit more like you're, you're settling in, you're getting to know the area. If you're interested in sports or you've got a particular interest um, such as dance or anime, um, you might find that you want to join one of our societies as well. These are run by the Students' Union, so check those out. If you do have a particular interest and a society doesn't already exist, you can speak to your SU rep once you're a registered student and they can help you set up a society as well. And again, it's a great way to meet people who've got similar interests to you. Sports clubs, if you're particularly into sports, um, you can actually look at those as well. We do have something for all abilities. So if you're just starting out, you want to try something new, you're more than welcome to join. And if you're at a higher level wanting to do this a bit more professionally, you can actually represent the uni at competitions against other universities as well. There's also Heart Squad events. So Heart Squad run a lot of sports programs at the university. They do offer free events and there's some clubs that you can also pay to join as well if you did want to. And we also have our chaplaincy and religious groups as well. Now, some things that you can do now to help you prepare while you're waiting um, is the university has created a free online platform. Um, it's called Getting Ready to Study at Hearts and it's just an online workbook that has a lot of information in there. So there'll be things like um, how to do well with your academics, just tips for academic success. There's also some video guidance from other international students about things they wish they'd known before they started university. Um, more links to the support teams as well so you can get familiar with them and a few other resources as well so do take your time to work through that module it'll really help you hit the ground running when you start at hearts now is also the time to book your accommodation so if you haven't already done so you can do that now we do have on-campus accommodation available on both college lane and de havilland and we do recommend that you live on campus if possible for you, just because it comes with some extra perks. So you don't need to have a UK guarantor. Um, you'll have all your utility bills, Wi-Fi and contents insurance included as well. And there's also 24-7 support. So if you need support at any point, you've accidentally locked yourself out of your room, you've always got that support. And also it's a lot closer to the facilities on campus. So if you're someone who wants to study late at night in the LRC, you've just got a short walk then back to your accommodation as well. Now, if you are looking to live off campus for any reason, there are a few bits that you need to be aware of. So you must live within a maximum two hour or 30 mile radius from campus. Now, I do stress that is the maximum. I wouldn't recommend that you aim to live that far because, as Nathan said earlier as well, it's going to make it quite challenging for you getting in, especially if you're relying on public transport and that cost is going to add up. So make sure that you've done your research on commute times and costs. Check out the National Rail website for trains and check out the Uno bus website for buses as well. With your trains, you'll also need to be aware that in the UK, there's peak train prices and non-peak. If you're going to be traveling to get into your morning lectures, so that'll usually be if you're traveling between, say, 
seven and nine, you're going to be paying the peak prices as well. So take that into account when doing your research. Um, always look for PAL accredited properties. Now, PAL is on our website and we can drop the link into the chat for you as well. But what PAL is, it's a scheme that the university has set up with the local council. Um, and it's just a website where you can view off campus properties. All the landlords which are displaying properties on the website have been vetted. We know that the properties match what they look like in the pictures and any deposit that you've had to pay is held securely as well. So do protect yourself from scams and only use PAL accredited properties. If you are seeing people advertising off campus properties on social media, if it sounds too good to be true, the chances are it probably is. Please do protect yourself from scams and just do a bit more research to make sure that whatever you're signing up for is genuine to protect yourself and so that you don't lose any funds as well. And the last thing you can do is clear those outstanding conditions. So if you do have, um, you'll check your most recent offer email, work out what's still outstanding. So do you need to do amended personal statement? Are we still waiting on any qualifications from you? So check that out. And if you're not sure, you can speak to your agent, your in-country rep, or you can email us at international at hearts.ac.uk for us to check for you as well. Make sure you put your student ID on any communications just so we can find your file a bit easier for you. And if you haven't already done so, now is also the time to pay your deposit to secure your place onto the course. So you can pay your deposit um, through our online page. So we have various different ways that you can pay. Um, our recommended one is on the page for you so that you can select um, which currency that you want to pay in as well. So it'll do a conversion for you. And also, you know that your funds are going through a secure payment method. So do check out the page on our website. You should have all already received an email with the secure links to that page as well. But if you're ever unsure, if anybody's ever asking you paid somewhere different, please do stop, think and check and contact someone at the international office or your in-country rep so we can check that out for you. OK, and now we've just got... Um, one of the final videos. So this is from um, some of our students who are just showing you some of the rooms on campus to give you an idea of what they look like on the inside as well. Hi, I'm Elizabeth and today I'm going to show you all of the amazing things of why did I choose to live on College Land campus. First, let's start with my bedroom. It's so close to classes and contains everything that you need. And here's my kitchen, where I get to meet all of my flatmates. However, for larger gatherings, we have got common rooms. Perfect for everything from group yoga to movie nights. And not to forget the oval. It's great to have a team of support staff to help with just about everything. And a gym for those post-lecture workouts. That really is everything you need on campus. Whether you like to go for a walk outdoors, or if you like to get your focus to the max in the RRC. Looking for a quiet space to pray, meditate or reflect? Well, the key is the place to visit. Whatever faith you have or even you have none. Here in the Hutton Hub, you can access to all kinds of information with our Ask Hearts Hub. For the best night out, I definitely visit 77 here at the Forum. Over to you, Judith. Hi everyone, welcome to the Haviland. I'm Judith and I'll be showing you why living here is amazing. The bedrooms are particularly great. You have absolutely everything you need in here. Say hello to the kitchen, where all the cooking and catching up with flatmates happens. In need of support, there's a whole team of staff ready to help here in the accommodation office. And just next door is the common room. Many a games night have been hosted in here. But when you're feeling extra energetic, you can head over to the sports village. It's great to come over after classes to get a workout in at the gym or take a dive in the huge pool. Just like College Lane, this campus has its very own LRC and also the beautiful Cafe Ambition with its great music and even better coffee. So that's a wrap. Thanks for coming along with us. Hope to see you on campus soon. And if you do want to see any more campus tour videos as well from students showing their rooms, do go on to the University of Hertfordshire YouTube channel um, and you can check out those room tours as well. Um, but now, thank you so much for your patience, everybody. I can see we've had some questions put through, um, so we'll be going through them now as well.
brilliant. Thank you so much, Kat. And thank you, everybody, for all your brilliant questions. Nathan, I've got um, a question for you and quite a few questions for you that I'll be um, handing over to you. So we've got a question from a couple of students and they're interested to find out what programming languages would be used for the undergraduate programmes and the postgraduate programmes and would this differ between the different courses? Okay, um, so for the undergraduate programmes in your first year, there would be a mix of Python, C and some assembly language. I think those are going to be the most the major languages you're going to be working with. And then I think a bit of Java in the second year. So it's going to be a mix of Python, C, Java, and um assembly. I think assembly is in the first year on a specific module. And on the MSC, I see a specific question about um artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's going to be Python and then that's it. Okay, yeah, for the AI and machine learning course, it's going to be Python. And for robotics, I think somebody asked about ro robotics. So it will probably be proprietary software for the robots. So I think there might be visual programming and some scripts and whatever spe um, specialized language is available for that robot. But I think it's also going to be mixed with Python too. Um of advise applicants to start preparing and, and learning this uh, programming language or will they be doing that on the course, Nathan? I think for the undergraduate in the first year, you're go if you're starting with us from the first year, you're going to be learning a lot of Python. We're going to first introduce you to discrete maths that teaches you about things like algorithms and data structures and better prepares you for programming. But if you're on the MSc, we would expect that you have knowledge of these languages already. So if you have not, you can start learning a bit of Python. I would expect you should know that already if you're applying to an, an MSc, you should have some experience with programming languages already because that's uh, one of the requirements for the degree. And if you're joining us for the top up, you can also start working on um, learning some programming. So think about Python, C and Java. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nathan. That's great advice. Kat, I've got a question for you. Um, an applicant asked, is there an official deadline for paying the deposit? And if there isn't, what would you recommend to applicants? That's a really good question. I bet a lot of people are thinking the same. So there's not an official deadline. However, we can't progress your application until you've cleared your conditions and paid your deposit. What we usually advise applicants is if if you've got your deposit now and it's ready to go, send that payment through because then it's going to take a bit of time to clear into the university's account um, and then admissions can progress you to that next stage. We can already start issuing CAS for everybody who's ready. There's also some um, discounts or scholarships that you might be able to get depending on what course you're doing if you're able to pay your deposit by a certain deadline. So check those out on our scholarships pages as well, if you haven't already seen the emails about them. Um, so basically we recommend make your deposit payment as soon as you can. If courses did start filling up as well, if you've paid your deposit, it means your seat is secured and you've got your place on there. Thank you so much, Kat. And there are some really interesting and brilliant scholarships um, that we have currently on the website. So definitely check those out with the day. Nathan, I've got a really interesting question for you. So students have asked, can you give us a, a rough idea about how many classes we might have per week for the undergraduate courses and the postgraduate courses, just so people are aware of the expectations for attendance? Um, so the expectation from you is you should be available every day of the work week, so from Monday to Friday. And most lectures will be between eight and eight. So just make sure you would have a timetable that will be published before maybe a week or two weeks before the semester starts. So you would know what days you would have lectures. But the expectation is you should be able to respond to anything where if you need to be on campus between Monday and Friday. And in special cases, you might have an assessment on a Saturday, but that's not common. If you have an assessment on a Saturday, you would probably be notified about the up months before. But you should try to make sure you're available from Monday to Friday, from 8 to 8. And then once you get your timetable and you know specifically 
what days you're supposed to be in, then you can plan around that. I can't give you any specifics now because the timetables have not been published. That's brilliant advice. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that. And that will really help people prepare as well. Thank you. Pat, I've got a question for you. What is the LRC? Another great question. So LRC, that's just an abbreviation that we use. It actually stands for our Learning Resources Centres. So there are big libraries that we've got on campus. There's one on College Lane, one on DHAV. Um, they host lots of journals, books. There's also workspaces with computers or places that you can go and take your own laptop as well. Um, so, yeah, you'll probably spend a lot of time in those once you get to campus. Thank you so much, Kat. And they are really impressive. Um, and registration only happens at the LRC on College Lane campus. So, yeah, it'll be a brilliant introduction for you to the RLRC. Thank you, Kat. Nathan, I've got um, another question for you. So students have said, can we get a bit more information about the placement years and the placement opportunities and internship opportunities? So for the placement year, I think it's a choice if you're on your undergraduate degree. It's a choice in the third year as you go on a placement year and you would start to apply for that at the start of your second year. So you would start to look for employers and I think you can do that with the careers firm. They would give you the help you need and advice and help you with your applications. But the general thing is you are expected to look for employers. We'll help you. You would look, look, apply and apply for as many as you can. And also for the MSC with the sandwich, um, the sandwich, there's a placement for that. And we will help you in doing your applications, but you would need to look for employers. And we would suggest employers to you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nathan. So there will be support, but it's really good for the applicants and offer holders to be aware that they can use their own initiative as well to look for employers too. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Kat, um, a student has asked, when exactly can I fly to the UK after receiving my visa? Is there a time frame in relation to this? So usually with your visa, um, you'll be able to enter the UK up to 30 days before your course start date. So that's another reason why we say get everything cleared so you can start your visa application as soon as you can. Um, just be mindful, though, if you are entering the UK 30 days before your course start date, you need to make sure you have arranged your accommodation as well. So you make sure you've got somewhere to stay when you get to the UK. Um, the on-campus accommodation, that usually opens um, either if you've got an early course start date, you'll be able to get in for then or during the orientation week as well. So you can contact the accommodation team to check if you are planning to stay on campus. Brilliant. Thank you, Kat. Um, and Nathan, a student asked, is it um, or is getting a job easier in the UK after someone's received a master's? Um, and also uh, a follow on question is, are there any research opportunities at the university? Um, and what would someone need to do if they wanted to become a research assistant at the university? OK, so there are job opportunities in the UK when you get an MSc. It, it depends on, so you would have to apply and you can discuss this when you're here with the careers firm and they would help you in um, making your applications. And concerning research, if you're interested in research, you could go on from a master's to a research degree. I think that's what I did too. I went from a master's to a research degree. So if you're interested in doing a PhD, that's an opportunity we have. If you want to be a research assistant, um, that would depend on, you would have to well engage with different people who are doing different kinds of research and see if there is any possibilities. But I would say the greatest way to get into that kind of area is to go on to do a research degree with us. And then you would have, I think that's a, a three-year program. And then you can go on to be a post uh, postdoctoral research fellow for other things. Okay. Brilliant, thank you so much. I'm really good for people to be aware of that and prepare as well. Thank you, Nathan. Pat, I've got a question for you. Um, a student has asked, are there opportunities for part-time jobs on campus? Again, really good question shows that you're you're preparing. Um, so there are some 
jobs that are actually on campus that some students do. So for example, some students will get roles as student ambassadors um, that might involve being a unibody assistant which is like a live chat that some students do to help others um, there's also things like giving campus tours there are other jobs on campus as well like we have our on-campus shop however I just want to set your expectations because these jobs are so convenient um, they are quite in demand they you know there might be a lot of competition to get them so we do find that a lot of our students will be looking outside the university campus for part-time jobs. So you might be looking in the Hatfield area or any of the local towns that you can get to on the UNO bus route. Um, I would just say, though, make sure that you are doing a good study work life balance so the most important thing for you is your studies that's the reason you're here you know you're paying your course fees for that so any part-time work you are doing make sure that you're still allowing yourself plenty of time to do all your lectures your seminars the private research outside of study time as well and also make sure you're sticking within your visa allowance you can do up to 20 hours of work per week on your student visa Brilliant. Thank you, Kat. Nathan, I've got a question for you. So we've got um, a student with us today. They'll be joining the second year of um, the BSc Computer Science programme. And they've just wants to know how would they be assessed? Obviously, they, they didn't study with us the first year. They're coming for the second year onwards. How um, would the assessments uh, kind of work at the university and how would they be assessed with the fact that they'd be bringing different credits from a different institution? Okay, so they will be assessed based on the credits they've carried over and the credits from the second year they will study with us and the final year. And usually our assessments are a mix of coursework and exams and in-class tests. And um, is there something I'm missing there? But, well, uh, kind of other assessments that, that you'd have with the different Degrees. So, say for example, what assessment methods would you have, Nathan, for the undergraduate courses, maybe in comparison to postgraduate courses as well? Okay, so for the assessments, it's I'd say it's mostly it's mostly coursework, um, exams, in class tests, and um, sometimes presentations on a model I teach on the final year. One of the the, the final um assessments is a presentation is a group presentation so you would have team projects too on some modules where that's a requirement for you to work in a team but it's a good mix so sometimes you would have maybe 50 percent coursework and a 50 percent as an exam or sometimes it could be 80 percent coursework 20 percent in class tests so it's kind of it's, it's, it's a mix and it depends on the specific modules you are studying Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nathan. Kat, we have a few students ask um, about the CAS process. So, you know, they've said they've provided their documents, they've paid their deposit. How long might they need to wait for their CAS? And, and we have a kind of a, a rough time frame of um, how long the admissions team are working on those. I know they're working as quickly as possible and incredibly hard on issuing CAS now, which is really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, if you've if you've cleared all your conditions, sent all your documents in, you've done absolutely the right thing. So admissions will be checking those. Um, what they might do is they might then invite you to either complete a sponsorship interview or they might advise you that you need to do your financial checks before they can issue that CAS to you. If these are required, they will send out some guidance. So there's some PDF guidance booklets on both of those processes and a bit more step by step on what you'd need to do for those. Um, once you've cleared those or if they're not required for you, as soon as your CAS is ready, the admissions team will usually send it to you via email. Um, so I would just recommend keeping on your emails. If you've done everything they've asked for, we're now just waiting for them to produce that for you. Um, they are working through them all, as Jess said, as quickly as possible, um, trying to get people through in date order of once they became ready for CAS as well. So if you can imagine, a lot of students around this time are finishing submitting all their documents, they're getting their exam results in. Um, so we've just had a bit of a wait of those so please be patient and they will send yours as soon as they can brilliant thank you so much Kat um, and it's so exciting they're issuing cards now so yeah really really brilliant news um Nathan in relation to kind of students preparing to come and study with us are there certain skills you'd recommend that the students start preparing 
any kind of reading that they should be doing or, you know, perhaps a laptop, any specifications in relation to that? What would your kind of top tip be for our undergraduate and postgraduate students that will be joining us in September? I would say for the undergraduate program, if you could start to learn some Python, because um, one of your modules will be, it's a mix of um, discrete paths and some Python. So it would be good if you have an understanding of Python and how that works. So learn that programming language. You can start doing that. There's lots of um, things online, um, courses online you can use to do that, or just easy um, websites where you can just have a play around. And for the MSc, I would say also just start to work on your programming skills. And maybe for you can already start to look at what the modules you're going to do are and think of what kind of knowledge you would need for those modules. For example, if you're getting into data science and analytics, you might want to start thinking of things relating to statistics and well, also that Python too, because you would be using a lot of Python for um processing data and all of that. So things like libraries and Python, like pandas and things like that. And uh, I would say, yeah, start to prepare yourself to think about how your study life is going to be, what it is you're going to be doing, how you're going to balance that and make sure you're focusing on study because that's the main reason why you're, you're going to be here. And another thing I would add is for the undergraduates, in the first and the second year, everyone is going to be studying the same thing. And then in the final year, that's when you work on your specific specialization. So if you've picked AI or you've picked software engineering, your specializations will be in that final year. I think the only difference is for people who are studying IT where there's a bit of a difference in the second year. Yeah, and that's everything for me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nathan. Great advice for our applicants. And um, Pat, I'll come to you for the, the final question. Um, do we know when the start date will be for the September intake and when orientation week will be as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, most of you will be on the general university start date, which I believe um, is the 23rd of September this year. We will be publishing these dates on our website as well, close to the time. Um, if for any reason your particular course has an earlier start date, that'll be displayed in your offer letter. It'll also state it on your CAS as well. Usually the orientation week that we do will start one week before main start of term. So that'll probably be starting on around the 16th of September. Um, and then I would expect likely the Heathrow Free Airport collection will be on the 14th and 15th. Now, we're just waiting to confirm those dates, get coaches booked and everything. But as soon as all those dates are confirmed, we will let you know and we'll let you know and we can start booking you on to the airport collection as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Kat. Nathan, I can see you've got your hand up over to you. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add one more thing. So for computers, we would have computers in the lab where you can do most of your programming and most of the work you need to do. And in the LRC, we also provide computers which would have software tools and software that you would need to use. And if you are bringing a computer, just you need a Windows laptop with a decent processor, something decently modern. But if you need to do any work that's heavy, I think we have decently specs computers on campus you can use for that kind of work. Okay, yeah, that's that's me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And really worth people knowing that as well. Thank you so much, Nathan. And thank you, everybody, for all your questions. Kat, I'm going to pass back to you now. Excellent. Thank you so much both as well. Um, if we didn't get to answer your question live, I'm so sorry, but they were some brilliant questions there. And it really shows that you're thinking and planning ahead. Um, now, a few more resources just before we go. So if you do want to hear from more of our students, our international students about their recommendations for your time at Hearts, any tips they've got, um, but you can go and check these out. They're on our YouTube channel, but they're also on our Instagram reels as well. As we get more student stories, we'll be adding those. We're also going to be doing some live Instagram Q&As over the summer on the run up to start of term as well. We usually have guests from various teams across the uni. So keep an eye on those and you're welcome to join those as well. And we'll answer more questions. Um, 
Now, for those of you who might still need help with something, do feel free to contact us at international at hearts.ac.uk. Just remember to put your student ID number on any emails, just helps our staff access your details a bit quicker. If you do have any urgent queries, you can also feel free to call our team on the number on screen as well. Um, and as I've said, do feel free to follow us on Instagram if you do want to get notified for any of those Q&A live sessions that we'll be doing. Any webinars that we do in the future, we'll be sending you out invites via email so you can book on exactly like this one as well. Um, we have come to the end of the session now, though. So I'm just going to play another short video of some of the sites around campus. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for attending today and for your questions. And we can't wait to speak to you again later in the summer. Thank you.